Hello students, welcome back to the course on organizational behavior, individual dynamics in organization. Today we move to the fourth lecture of creativity, psychological capital and mindfulness. Today we'll look into uh, psychological capital specifically. I'm Dr. Abraham Salisak. I'm a faculty at the School of Business, Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati. So today's theme would be the concern is optimal human functioning and not pathological human functioning. So every now and then in organization, we tend to perform or we tend to look into optimal human functioning. So when we look into the positive organizational behavior, evolution of the concept of positive psychology has to be detailed. Let's look into positive organizational behavior, evolution of the concept in positive psychology specifically. Now psychologist Martin Seligman and a few others emphasized on the strengths and other positive features of people that make life worth living. So when we try to understand positive psychology, we have to understand there are things which are sometimes positive, there are things which are sometimes felt negative also. So when you look into the positive side or the positive things in general, that is the focus that positive psychology generally makes. So this came as a reaction to the already existing method of analyzing behavior only on the basis of defects and their cure. So mainly behavior was considered as reaction and those reactions which came as to the initial reactions of whether if it's a negative reaction, how do, how do we take care of that or what, to, what would be the curing mechanism, what would be the corrective mechanism associated to with that. So that was the thought process that was running and the aim of positive psychology is to use scientific methodology to discover and promote the factors that allow individuals, groups and organizations and communities to thrive. So basically we are looking into uh, uh, an extension of OBM where we try to emphasize on scientific methodology. Similarly, we try to use scientific methodology in positive psychology as well to promote the factors even in the purview of individuals, groups, organizations and communities. So it is concerned with more of optimal human functioning instead of pathological human functioning. So we are in this theme, we are more concerned with how we can optimize the functioning of human behavior, how human beings can perform to the best efforts and that is what the concern is all about. When we look into positive organizational behavior, according to Fred Luthens, it is nothing but the study and application of positive oriented human resource strengths and psychological capacities that can be measured developed and effectively managed for performance improvement in today's workplace. So when we look into this particular definition, there are certain functional words like measure. So time and again, I've tried to establish the relevance of measurement when it comes to a, a latent construct. So when we look into aspects of uh, positive oriented human resource strengths and even psychological capacities, we need to understand that we need to measure them. We need to have an understanding of those measurements. Then we can develop and effectively manage for performance improvement. Now, when we look into specifically positive organizational behavior or more specifically in positive psychology, it is subject to or it is embellished by three aspects. One is valued subjective experiences, which includes, let's say, well-being, contentment, satisfaction. Satisfaction could be satisfaction in the past, when we look into hope and optimism for the future, and even flow and happiness in the present. So valued subjective experiences are critical. There are also important relevances associated with positive individual traits. Now, when we look into positive individual traits, it's, it's nothing but the capacity for the vocation and love, courage, interpersonal skill, aesthetic sensibility, perseverance, forgiveness, originality, future-mindedness, spirituality, high talent, wisdom, etc. Again, this cannot be an exhaustive list, but we are looking into such positive individual traits when we are 
more uh, discussing on positive psychology. It also looks into a third aspect which is civic virtues and the institutions that move individuals towards better citizenship like responsibility, nurturance, altruism, civility, moderation, tolerance and even work ethic. So when we look into the entire positive psychology, it is actually pulled up by three important factors. One is the value subjective experiences as I have as I've already listed down. Second is the positive individual traits which also have a certain influence. And the third is civic virtues and the institutions that move individuals towards better citizenship. Now let's understand the work performance in accordance to the health relationship work model. Health relationship work models is being taken from the Fred Luthen's textbook. When we look into the health relationship work model, this is one of the most critical model that will emphasize the relevance of relationship, the work and the health in an organizational context. So we sometimes uh, try to bring ourselves into the argument of work-life balance. We, there, are, there are opposing views that you have to work these many hours within a week, within a day. This is something which is looked forward or expected out of any individual. But that said, to maintain a healthy environment both in your office or an organization as well as at your home, it is essential to understand the intricate relationship between work performance, your health and relationship. These are connected and this is beautifully explained by the health relationship work model. Work experience from PSYCAP, psychological capital, there is a connection to health which looks into both the physical as well as the mental aspects of health and it is also connected to your social networks, your friends, life, partners, etc. Your family all come under this realm of relationship. The, your health is important both physical as well as mental and work performance from PSYCAP angle is connected to both. So when you are looking into effective positive intention open to one's control and development is what the health relationship work model actually underscores. So when we are talking about your performance in an organization sometimes you see that some of the performers the best performers in an organization sometimes they go down just like that. The reason could be that they are not able to maintain this balance of health, relationship, work performance. Sometimes your work performance is affected by your social networks, your relationships. Sometimes you are having uh, some family problems. You feel, you tend to understand that your, your work performance in your organization is getting affected. You cannot focus on your work. You, can, you do not have the full commitment towards work because there is lack of concentration, lack of focus. There could be issues, health issues, either physical or mental. There might be some uh, uh, health issues which is not giving you or not letting you to work in a very peaceful or mindful manner. The, you are not in a position to put your full uh, focus onto your work because of lack of, let's say, concentration, because you are having some uh, mental issues. Or there might be some physical concerns which are actually not enabling you or uh, you are not so equipped to actually perform the work that is otherwise required. So health relationship work model essentially connects these three vital parameters within an organizational setup. Now when you look into psychological capital, we have to understand what exactly it is to actually work around that. An individual's positive psychological state of development is characterized by one, having confidence. So I'm coming to the most important part of today's lecture, which is self-efficacy. To take on and put in necessary effort to succeed at challenging tasks. Making a positive attribution, it could be with respect to optimism about succeeding now and in the future. So when you are having self-efficacy, that is one important factor which gives you the necessary psychological capital. Another important aspect is the optimism, the positive attribution towards the future. Persevering toward goals and when necessary redirecting parts towards goals which is also underscored as hope in order to succeed. So when you are actually talking about creativity, if you recollect in the first lecture, I had already mentioned about the relevance of importance of the perseverance in creativity. Many a time people tend to 
get into trial and error method and trial and error method inevitably fails because there is lack of perseverance. When there is perseverance happening or when there is uh, perseverance displayed by an individual, we see that they work towards a particular goal and that is what makes them more creative and more makes them more result oriented. When beset by problems and adversities, sustaining and bouncing back and even beyond resiliency, that's the factor beyond to attain success is marked by resiliency. So we have self-efficacy, optimism, we have hope and we have finally resiliency as key determinants of psychological capital. When you look into self-efficacy or confidence, we have to thank Albert Bandura. Albert Bandura's work actually underscores the relevance of self-efficacy. When you look into self-efficacy, particularly it is embedded within the theory that there is an element of self-regulation and self-reflection. Self-efficacy is nothing but that I can, the spirit that I can and I will, that, that level of confidence. People reflect back on their actions, experience with a specific event or maybe task to cognitively process how strongly they believe they can actually successfully accomplish the task or accomplish the event. So it is more about uh, the level of confidence you have in yourself in establishing or in doing the particular task. So there is an element of a uh, certain element of self-regulation and self-reflection that for example, while doing a task, you have to monitor yourself that am I going the right way or are there any other documentary evidences or aspects or information pieces of information which I, I, I didn't see. You have to double check every now and then that is there some relevant critical information that I'm missing out. So there is also a possibility that you may actually look into it from a different dimension altogether. So self-regulation enables you to keep a real-time check over what you are doing or what you, you are supposed to do. And similarly, self-reflection. You have, let's say you have undertaken a project and 60% of it has done. It is time to look back and see whether you have done it correctly because when you are going to the completion, there is a possibility that you may falter and you have to revisit the whole thing. So better keep incremental steps at each point so that you get to understand it, you get to uh, perform it and if there is some problems, you can always revisit that. So this is where the, the concept of self-efficacy becomes critical. When you look into self-efficacy, unless people believe that they can produce the desired effects and forestall undesired ones by their actions, they have little incentive to act. So whatever other factors may operate as motivators, they are rooted in the core belief that one has, one has the power to produce the desired results. So this essentially underscores what Albert Bandura conceptualizes as self-efficacy. Now, when we look into uh, other definitions of self-efficacy, an individual's conviction or confidence, because the whole point that you can do it, that emanates from the conviction or confidence that individual is having about his or her abilities to mobilize the motivation, cognitive resources, and courses of action needed to successfully execute a specific task within given context. So you might not be under the impression that you can uh, say uh, or bid uh, farewell to context. No, it might be that some situations you you might you might see some task which is doable. You must have done those tasks earlier with great ease. You must have you seen those people who are undertaking those tasks with great ease. But are you in a position to take up or do that or find out the solution for that problem at present? In this context, with the maybe the context would be the context of resource constraint, the context of having abusive uh, boss or the context would be uh, having a situation where you know you don't have a, uh, you know your subordinates cooperating with you. So in that particular position, are you in a, in, a, in a particular situation to replicate, to bring out the same solution within that context? So that is quite relevant when it comes to self-efficacy. That essentially shows the power of self-efficacy. 
Now, specific versus general self-efficacy is a discussion. I would like to take it up here. Specific self-efficacy follows basically Bandura's conceptualization and is widely recognized by almost all the specific uh, scholars who have worked in the research area of self-efficacy and psychology uh, altogether. But when you look into something called as general efficacy, in recent research, in recent times specifically, researchers have used a broader meaning of self-efficacy in which they actually try to underscore that self-efficacy is more trait-like, that is, it is relatively permanent, like, let's say, a personality trait. It is a person's perception of their ability to perform across a variety of situations. So, general efficacy is a bit different from what self-efficacy. Self-efficacy was more of a quality. Self-efficacy could have been imbibed. Self-efficacy could have been trained. But there is something called a general efficacy that researchers are, are bringing up something, eliciting something, which is nothing but a more generalized version. It is more of considering efficacy as a trait, as a personality trait. Like we have, let's say, openness or let's say, extraversion. Self-efficacy is also a trait. Self-efficacy is also imbibed in a particular person. So, irrespective of the context, there might be people who are, who are having high self-efficacy. But there are obviously arguments against that also. But please try to understand in specific context, you might have a different approach. Whereas in the same context, there are people who do it successfully. So, essentially, there are situations where you have to accept their argument that or the researchers who work in general efficacy, their argument that yes, it is possible that it is more trait-like. Now, we have to also understand that self-efficacy uh, is not devoid of the context. There is relevance of context it, when it is looked as state-like, situationally based, open to learning, change and development. So, specifically, it is aimed at specific tasks and open to training and development. So, it is not like it is inborn. So, there are different perspectives, again, that research is bringing in. So, a lot of research is happening in the area of self-efficacy and there is a equal and diametrically opposite voice emerging. One of general self-efficacy which, which, which tries to posit uh, the efficacy, general efficacy more as a trait, whereas there is self-efficacy, uh, the, re the research going on that, which, which actually posits uh, efficacy as more of a state-like situation. So, when we look at self-efficacy in, in particular, we are actually looking at it as something which could be trained, which could be imbibed into a particular individual. The impact of self-efficacy also has to be discussed. The self-efficacy process generally affects the human functioning directly and indirectly. So, when you are looking into the direct effect, the self-efficacy process starts before the individuals select their choices and initiate their effort. So, let's look into the situation. First, people tend to weigh, they tend to evaluate and integrate information about their perceived capabilities. Nobody will start saying, yes, I can, yes, I will do it. If it is a calculated, if it is a prudent and pragmatic statement made by an individual, then first people tend to weigh, evaluate what they tend to develop a clear understanding about themselves. Then they will be able to understand that these are their capabilities, these are their potentialities and based on this, you might be able to do it or you might not be able to do it. If you are able to do it, then you might be the right person for that job then you tend to believe and uh, articulate that you are se having self-efficacy. So, the initial stage of the process has more to do with how they perceive or believe they can use these abilities and resources to accomplish the given task in this context. So, this particular perception leads to the expectation of personal efficacy, which in turn determine the choice behaviors, the motivational effort, the perseverance of the particular individual, facilitative thought patterns and even vulnerability to stress. So, all these factors are the impact of self-efficacy. All these factors generally come out as the outcome of self-efficacy. There could be some factors which actually trigger self-efficacy. When we look into the sources of information for self-efficacy, there has been detailed discussion till now.
in this course on mastery experiences. There are also discussions that have happened on performance attainment. Please recollect the sessions where I have tried to underscore that in organization there are two possibilities. One is whether you are having an organization which is having a mastery climate. There could be other organizations where you are more performance oriented. So there, when you are into a situation of more performance orientation, you might be more concerned about beating others, competition. You might be more concerned about how to outweigh others. Whereas when you are working in an organization with more of a mastery climate, your concern might be more of, you know, learning training, developing, increasing your own performance based on your learning, not based on uh, maybe uh, beating others or competing with others. There could be also sources of vicarious learning or vicarious experiences or vicarious modeling we have, which we have discussed in detail in the previous modules. So vicarious modeling is all about trying to learn from others. And please remember again, vicarious modeling would be more effective if you are trying to model from somebody who is close to you, who is at par with you in terms of the talent level, is in connection with you, he is more equal to you. Please remember the example which I have stated. You are trying to learn a particular shot in cricket. You might be more interested in knowing that your friend, let's say your, one of your friend is able to uh, make a pull shot or uh, do an excellent cover drive. He might be the best teacher for you in terms of vicarious modeling. You might not try to see that, okay, Virat Kohli is doing this, so I can do it. Sachin Tendulkar is doing this, so I can do it. That is not vicarious modeling. It's more of modeling with somebody who is, who is very close to you or he is equal to you in terms of the knowledge, skills or abilities or in terms of the talent in particular. There could be social persuasion. There might be some motivation that is coming in. Every now and then you might feel that you are working in a, in a team, in an organizational environment that is always pumped up, always too much of uh, upbeat about things to be done, always uh, brimmed with confidence. They are always, you know, motivating you, encouraging you. So you are working in such an environment where you have the motivation to do it. That is the social persuasion. Sometimes you feel that, yes, sometimes uh, you are working in an opposite environment. You are always dull. You are, you know, the organization is pulling down. The organization climate is very much detrimental. You feel pressurized. You feel ridiculed every time. You might go down. But there are situations when you are trying to, you know, people are uh, trying to push your spirits, you know, uh, making you more upbeat. So social persuasion actually leads to self-efficacy. And there is also a possibility of physiological and psychological arousal that can also lead you to self-efficacy. It, it hardly occurs. Please try to introspect. It has hardly occurred to you. Just introspect that in a state of very dull physical and psychological arousal that you can tell that you are having self-efficacy. So please understand that these are some of the sources of self-efficacy. So we are traveling through creativity. We are traveling through psychological capital. And when it comes to creativity and psychological capital, please understand the relevance of self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is not mere shouting, not mere shouting that I can do it. It's more than that. It is to understand and evaluate yourself, your capability, your strengths, your weaknesses, everything. Based on that holistic assessment, holistic analysis, are you able to pull it off? This is what self-efficacy is all about. A, a decision taken after this evaluation will make you understand whether you have the self-efficacy. Thank you for listening to me patiently. See you in the next class with, with more insights. Till then, take care. Bye-bye.